staccato handguns are trusted and approved by over 900 elite law enforcement agencies, including 65 SWAT teams. When it comes to accuracy and reliability, the choice is easy with staccato. Hey, welcome back. You're listening to Policing Matters on PoliceOne.com. I'm your host, Jim Dudley. Hey, response to critical incidents is unique to the incident at hand. We hope to prepare by training, planning, and exercising to respond to all hazards. We've seen some terrific examples of how plans and training have come together, with heroism being key in situations where officers have advanced on active shooters in order to stop the threat and to save lives. Unfortunately, we've seen some situations that did not play out according to plan. How can we effectively, at all levels of training, planning, and response, do a better job? Well, I have a great guest today. Nick Roberts enlisted in the United States Marine Corps in 2001 and served until 2007 with a combat deployment to Iraq in 2006. Nick has been a law enforcement officer since uh, 2009 and a SWAT team member since 2012, where he's currently an assistant team leader. He's held assignments in patrol, training, special enforcement, and is currently a detective with the Chino Police Department. Nick teaches firearms, tactics, and active shooter response. Hey, welcome to Policing Matters. Nick Roberts, thank you for your service. Thank you, sir. Pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, as a SWAT team member and a leader, how would you rate our national efforts in training at the first responder field level? That's a good question. So I think that we've done a fantastic job as law enforcement and at least uh, being able to get that training out there for our first responders. I think that's been a huge shift in uh, a lot of the training that we've been receiving as law enforcement. Obviously, I think we can do better. There's lots of areas of improvement. Um, We can only do as good as we are funded. I think I'm one of those uh, type of people that make sure that uh, when we get out there that we do the uh, quality training, we get the quality training that we deserve and that our community deserves. So all these things matter. I think ultimately, you know, every community is different and uh, we all have different needs. And it's very important for us as law enforcement in general, whether it's city, county or state to be familiar with those areas that might be um, soft targets, as you would say, I suppose. Um, and uh, interagency compatibility with you know, uh, state level to local level um, and being able to communicate across county lines, city lines. When these things happen, we see a lot of responses from everybody. You know, if you hear of some massive incident going out, um, everybody responds to everything, you know, as as a a part of the uh, San Bernardino terrorist attack. And we had, you know, every unit available is there. And so there's some some problems that we can get out of those things and and help ourselves in the future. but gosh, uh, just the level of training that we have been doing to improve on that, I think in LA, we're a little bit behind with all the training overall, but we've been doing better, you know, fighting a good fight out there with the medical training and uh, the active shooter training and response. And now a lot of, the, even like locally for us, the fire department's included in all the active shooter stuff. And we're including the uh, the community as well and schools. So run, hide, fight's a big thing. And I think education is a big part of all of that. So. Yeah, no, you bring up some some great um, issues. And I mean, my question was was phrased specifically in our field level response and great response there as a SWAT operator in California, we determine training standards to be certified in SWAT. Uh, Some smaller agencies said, hey, we're going to hand out uh, knee pads and elbow pads and a rifle and you're a member of SWAT. And we knew that wasn't enough. Are we doing enough training for these specialists? And then let's go there. And then I want to ask you about leadership as well. But are we doing enough minimal standard training for SWAT operators? So I can only speak to California and Southern California in specific. We have the, you know, police officer standards and training guidelines that uh, all SWAT team members need to go through. And I think that that's highly important to get a good baseline across the board of where and how we're trained. Um, to do these things. I think there's a big uh, checklist of all the things that we need to make sure that get accomplished throughout that training. And it's a two week course uh, for SWAT school. And it's pretty extensive and it includes physical fitness and includes, you know, planning preparation and um, uh, along with shooting and all those other things that uh, 
are a part of that. Uh, and I think that we are doing well. I don't know, nationwide. Uh, I couldn't really speak to how it goes across the board. Um, anything past that, there's not really much standards. I know that uh, California Association of Tactical Officers, Cato, um, is uh, got some standards that they're putting forth, and we're trying to make sure that uh, we get some ongoing training as SWAT team members. And, you know, obviously you have the uh, specifics, whether it be breaching training or uh, gas school or precision rifle or what have you. Those are all specialty kind of trainings within trainings kind of thing. But um, I think it's important that we at least acknowledge that, hey, there needs to be some sort of ongoing training, whether it's the department or, you know, the, the uh, county or the state that um, says, hey, we need some sort of ongoing training to make sure that our professionals stay up to date with uh, the current trends and what's relevant to our uh, our needs. Yeah, and, and and like you talk about, uh, you know, the field level and, and first responders, our inner perimeter people are often trained in engagement, right? Are we doing enough to train our management people, that next level, maybe the decision makers, lieutenants and above, they show up and may, may assume the role of the incident commander. Uh, are we making sure that they understand the capabilities of SWAT teams and first responder officers? I mean, you know, without naming the incidents, I mean, we've had hundreds of officers show up only to be stymied by, um, you know, the bottleneck at management level. Are we doing enough there? Yeah. So, I mean, and that's that in itself is probably we could do a whole podcast on that and leadership and management of uh, uh, special teams. But, um, you know, I think there's something to be said about the the type of leadership and the style of leadership. I think that that is also very particular about um, what community you're from. Um, county is going to do a little bit different than city and, and state's going to be doing it a little bit different from county and even city to city is going to be a little bit different because each city has its own needs. Um, I think I think the most important part of that is the commander of whatever team that's going to be uh, taking lead on that is very familiar with the team's capabilities. And then they have good communication from the commander to the team level. Um, that's one of those things that we can appreciate as, uh, you know, line level uh, SWAT officers is, hey, you know, if I'm number one through the door, my responsibility and, you know, my, my I suppose, view of the incident shouldn't be that 30,000 foot view, you know, um, we, we need to have that. Um, we need to have those positions, uh, the rank and, uh, command structure is very important because I don't need to be worrying about, you know, have we notified, uh, this person or have we notified that person? I think that my job should be, what's the safest way to get through here? How, what's the safest way to make sure that these people, uh, surrender to us if that's the case, or if we can resolve the situation in a, in an easy and safe manner. That's that should be my my position on the ground, and uh, relay that information back up to the uh, the commanders. But I think that the the larger topic with this, more importantly, is the communication between agency to agency. You know, um, like you were saying, those those large scale incidences. Um, my question, I guess, to the those commanders and those leaders are. Can you speak with those other agencies around you via your radio? You know, does your dispatch have the capabilities to um, patch channels to county, to other local jurisdictions so that you guys can communicate well throughout those? Because you might have an incident commander on, on scene, but if that incident commander can't speak with all the units that are on scene in an effective way, then that's where the bottleneck is. And it might not be with that that leadership. Um, and so we might see that as, as the leadership bottleneck, but at the same time, um, the clear communication between everybody that's on scene, including the fire department, um, is huge. And so um, we might be able to, to have great training and we might be able to have um, all these great people that are in these positions. But I think we we sort of fail when it comes to the communication between agencies. Um, so I think that that's one of the things that at least we've seen on our end that we've been trying to make sure that we could patch through, we can all connect so if we did have some sort of mass uh, incident that we can all communicate well with each other, because that's really what the goal is going to be, is how do we effectively um, safely resolve a situation that might be a little bit more than the patrol level itself. So, Yeah, no, totally. Uh, interoperability and communication is so important. And in the ICS system, 
um, you know, the National Incident Management System, NIMS and ICS, uh, the Incident Command System. You've got that overarching incident command. And then for an operations branch, you've got specialized teams like SWAT. And it really is up to those uh, team leaders to be able sometimes maybe to push back or inform uh, somebody at that management level about what your capabilities are and and whether or not you can accomplish something that you're being asked to do. And uh, I think sometimes we need to encourage, you know, those field level people to have the ability to push back and, and maybe clarify something uh, to a manager who doesn't really understand the capabilities. Yeah. And, and usually those kind of incidents aren't really it's never an issue until it's an issue kind of thing. Right. <laughs> right. And uh, we, we've run into that quite a few times. And so I, I guess, again, the question that I would pose to those leaders of those teams or uh, even the uh, SWAT officers on those teams is, can you guys communicate effectively with your neighboring agencies, with the county agencies, with uh, Highway Patrol, with um, anybody else that might, might if, if you guys have a mass incident within your guys' jurisdiction or city or right outside, are you able to clearly communicate um, without playing the old, uh, you know, daisy chain and uh, telephone game, um, getting on board with all these agencies. If the answer is no, that's not a big deal, right? And this is the time to prepare for all those things is when something is not going crazy um, and get those things planned and at least have an idea of what's going to happen when those things happen, because uh, you would hate for something to happen. Uh, and I think we saw that um, in a couple of different places. I'm not going to name any sort of specific incidences, but um, the lack of communication to, you know, any sort of like school shooting, then who knows who's going in and when and why. And you're working with all these agencies and you might have a stack of three or four uh, people that are ready to go in. But who knows who's getting in charge and who knows who's communicating with who and, um, you know, whose fault is that? That's really the question. And the answer is it's nobody's real fault. It's really the lack of communication and the breakdown of communication that, that we have and the lack of preparedness that we have as an agency is something that we can plan for um, a little bit better. So we always try at least here um, to make sure that we have good communication with the surrounding agencies. We're able to have our dispatch patched through. We do tests. Um, we have good interoperability with the fire department. We run uh, drills and uh, practice scenarios with all of those things just to make sure that in some sort of critical incident that we we have that uh, first line of communication and we're able to actually get things done effectively as opposed to, you know, that that two minutes, that three minutes it might take to to get the word across from this agency to that agency might be too long. And so um, I would hate for that to be the case for anybody else. Yeah, I'm, we'll talk about that in, in a few minutes. The, you know, the blue team concept and the training that goes into uh, you know, the repetition and, and how we get things right. And we probably do a pretty good job when we can plan for an incident that we know is coming, but it's those spontaneous uh, incidents where, like you say, you better know your opposite number or your your other number from the other agency and mutual aid situation or from another department like fire or EMS and how important it is to, to create those lines of communication. We do that in the plan incidents, but maybe uh, you know we there, we fumble around a little bit in those spontaneous incidents, and uh, I think it's only through repetition and training that we sort of smooth smooth that road out a little bit. Um, what have you seen as the difference in the successful engagements with active shooters in the past few months, as opposed to some of our other failures? Where is the disconnect? We saw some where we just talked about that. There's that you know, blockage. And then uh, we had some really confident, well-trained people, uh, Nashville and and other places who did everything we wanted them to do, moved in and, you know, suppressed uh, and engaged the threat and mitigated. So what's the answer to, you know, between those failed events and these really successful ones? Gosh, I mean, that's a million dollar question right there, I suppose. Uh... You know, uh, I don't think our job is to second guess what people have done in the past. I think our job is to learn from the good and learn from the bad and take those things away and hopefully um, put those things into practice uh, in, a, in an effective manner. Um, I, I think a lot of the good, uh, I, the first thing I want to kind of talk about, I suppose, is having good people um, in those positions, you know, um, 
it's a it's a mindset thing, right? If if we sit around and and we as police officers just think that nothing's going to happen and everything's just great and all that, and no nothing's coming to our town because we're insert town here in this part of the United States and nothing ever happens here. Um, that's just the wrong you know mental attitude to have. Um, now I'm not saying that we need to be out there all gung ho and it's coming kind of thing and and the world is coming chicken little kind of thing at the same time, but. I think that there's a good balance in there that, you know, we need to have as police officers and have that mental strength to be able to acknowledge that these, these things are, you know, relevant these days um, in our society. And um, however unfortunate it is, or however you agree with it or don't agree with it, that there's always going to be bad people out there, um, regardless of how, how we feel, you know, um, right or left of the situation, these bad people are just going to do bad things. And, um, to whoever's listening is, is, are you prepared today for that? You know, um, I, I can't think of one person that that's ever been, um, in the situation where they're like, okay, cool. We're going to have a, we're going to have a shooting today and I'm totally prepared and I'm going to get all my equipment ready for that shooting. You know, like that, that's not the case. That's not what happens. And so, um, every day mental preparedness is one of those things that I think, uh, is huge in, in what we do as a field. And we have to have those good people that are able to do those kinds of things. Mm-hmm. Um, because I don't think anybody really joins, uh, the police force to, to cause harm to anybody. That's the last thing we want to do. The first thing we want to do is help people, right. Resolve things mm-hmm. peacefully, always be, uh, kind to those and, and, and have people be kind to us. But, um, unfortunately we're, we're not in charge of other people's decisions. And we are uh, in charge of making sure that we mitigate um, issues. And if somebody wants to um, create an issue, then we have tools that uh, we uh, use to make sure that those people stop what they're doing as soon as, uh, as soon as possible. And I think that having those good people in there that are available to do those things is, is huge and key. Um, where, where do we fall short? Gosh, we fall short so many ways. I mean, us as law enforcement, our, our training and even the equipment that we use is it's just old. It's, it's, it's old. We do a lot of things because that's the way it's always been done. I know that we always try to fight that stigma in law enforcement of, well, that's just the way it works. And that's just how it is around here. Um, we really need those people to be able to speak up and those leaders to be able to, to, to listen to that and say, you know what, maybe we can do a better job. And then how do we do that better job? You know, and is this in this job that's being, because everybody wants the widget, right? Everybody wants the fixing thing that fixes all the problems, but unfortunately that's not out there. Um, so um, with the people that come up with the ideas, Hey, I have this idea. What do you think about this? Does it meet the community's needs, right? Does it meet our needs as a, as a team or even on patrol, right? Um, and then is it cost effective? Because, you know, everybody wants night vision, but nobody can afford night vision, right? And then how often do you use it? And then is it relevant to the operations that you guys are currently um, doing? So um, it, it's just one of those things where I think there's a lot of uh, a lot of different angles that we can approach that. But good people stopping bad people is always what it's going to come down to, making sure that mindset is there, the training is followed, and then the equipment behind that. So um, I think all three of those things, if you can get those things lined up mm-hmm. within an agency, I think that's really going to be the key. So, yeah. And it seems like we're throwing around hundreds of millions of dollars for recruiting nationally, uh, sometimes from department of justice, but like you say, sometimes we're dealing with old equipment and there is great technology out there with the drone technology and throw phones and robots and, and all these other things that a lot of agencies, mostly you know, rural and small departments don't have access to. It'd be great to see those. Um, when you, you know, we talk about second guessing and, and I totally get you, nobody wants to be a Monday morning quarterback, but in my era of policing, I remember coming up and remembering and going through step-by-step some of these seminal um, uh, illustrations of poor response that led to police officers being killed. Um, New Hall incident, uh, Florida shootout with the FBI, even as recent as recent, it's like 20 years, the West Hollywood shootout, where step by step, we examine what went wrong. And that that helps us prepare after action reports are so necessary to let us know where we did drop the ball and how to improve. So I wish we had uh, some way of breaking these things down without hurting anyone's feelings, but but recognizing it. There was there was such a slow response to criticize leadership at a couple of these shootings when I think sometimes we need to call it what it is and and 
build on it and and make the rest of us better prepared. Yeah, I think that uh, that's a that's a fantastic point. I mean, I can speak to what we do. Um, you know, I can't I can't really speak to all agencies, but I think it is important to have these debriefs and critical debriefs of all these incidences, whether it be um, cause I know not every SWAT team out there is a full-time team, right? There's few of those and there's mostly part-time teams. Like our team is part-time, which is good and bad, right? Um, it's bad in the sense that if we were training 24 seven, obviously we would be at this high level, um, to be able to perform at, at a moment's notice drop of a hat kind of thing. Um, the, the good part is that we're integrated with all of the units that we work. So, all these part-time teams have patrol officers that have SWAT team members on the patrol team, or the detective bureau has SWAT team members on in the detective bureau, the gang team, whatever task force you're on, they might have a SWAT team member there because, you know, it might, it, it might be cool and sexy to be on the SWAT team. But at the same time, if you have an active shooter, we all know the SWAT team takes an hour, hour and a half to spin up um, at best. Right. Um, you might get a couple people out there, you know, within 20, 20 minutes or so, but those initial responding officers are the ones in charge of the scene. And if we can get that good leadership out there, I think that the key part of all of these uh, failures that I've seen is fair to act, right? So uh, one of the key things to point out is why, why are there, why is there a failure to act? You know, is it on the individual officer or that little team that's there? Is it because leadership doesn't give them the, you know, bandwidth to react to these situations and they're worried about being in trouble for something? Are they worried mm -hmm. about, uh, legalities having to deal with their actions if they did something, you know, I mean, um, law enforcement, even in the past five to seven years has changed all of the, uh, the hiring, like you said, everybody's putting money into hiring, but who are we hiring? Are we hiring the best people? Are we hiring good people? Are we hiring people with experience in life? Or are we just hiring people that fit in this little box of never been in trouble, never done this, never done that? And you as a, uh, a mentor would be one of those, I'm sure you can imagine the people that were hired around you, not always had the cleanest of records, the best of records. Sometimes you have people that were um, more prepared for the job because of the life experience that they brought with them. And so um, I know that that's part of it, but getting good people into these positions is number one key. And then it, past that, the leadership needs to give all these individual officers the bandwidth to make decisions out in the field. Because I can tell you that if if I felt comfortable making a decision, then I'm more likely to make a decision, even if I'm not worried about getting in trouble or getting sued or what mm -hmm. have you. You know, I mean, if the idea is uh, preservation of life, then they need to really be focused on that kind of stuff, as opposed to worrying about who's doing what or, you know, what can we involve this person or can we not? So, I mean, there's tons of topics and we can go over that all day long as well. You know, all these great um, questions and topics that you have. I think that these are really good discussions. So, yeah, no, no. I mean, you're hitting on some points that really strike in a, a nerve with me about the, our our backgrounding and, and who we're taking. But um, yeah, also some of the other issues that you're talking about. Yeah, we, we can do a whole nother show on those. But yeah. First, I'd like to take a moment and thank our sponsor, who you might be familiar with. Choose the handgun trusted by over 900 law enforcement agencies across the country. With Staccato, you can feel confident knowing you aren't sacrificing incredible accuracy for reliability. Whether you're protecting your family at home or on duty, Staccato has your back. Military and law enforcement receive discount pricing through the Staccato Heroes Program. Visit www.staccato2011 backslash heroes program.com to learn more. That's staccato, S T A C C A T O, 2011 backslash heroes program.com. And we're back, and I'm speaking with uh, Nick Roberts. And Nick, you are an ambassador to Staccato Firearms. I've seen you in some of the YouTubes and you are a big proponent of the weapons. What can you tell us about them? I am, by the way. And thank you. I'm uh, I'm very humbled to be a part of the team over at Staccato. And um, anybody that's ever talked to me has hopefully um, sees that, uh, you know, it, it's a great opportunity that we have, not only as law enforcement, but me in particular to meet, be around a bunch of great humans. Um, some veterans, former police officers, everybody over there at Staccato is just absolutely fantastic. And, you know, kind of like we mentioned earlier, it's, it's really the core of who is 
is uh, are the people that we interact with in life, right? And are the good people. And uh, Staccato is just one of those companies that is just from the top down, it's just great people. And um, so uh, with that, so what can I tell you about Staccato? So if I was talking to somebody that had no idea what a Staccato was or um, had never seen a Staccato, I brought one here and uh, I can show it to you, but essentially it's a single action only 1911 style. I coined the uh, 2011 um, kind of uh, idea because it's a instead of a single stack type of 45 caliber um, single action only gun like like a 1911 it's a double stack nine millimeter um, so you're increasing capacity you know double at least there instead of carrying 37 mags of uh, 45 for your uh, Springfield Armory uh, TRP operator Long Beach you're welcome Pat um, you get you get to carry you know one single little mag here that's got 16 rounds right and I think that uh, if you guys are listening to this uh, podcast, you're very familiar with firearms, I'm sure. And um, with all the FBI testing and all the testing that we do, caliber is essentially um, just a number these days. And it's all about where we put the bullets, right? Accuracy is final. And so um, which gun are you guys carrying that's going to help you be the best and the most efficient person um, for your job? And then how much is that worth to you, right? Because I think that the conversation is, uh, you know, when I when I talk to uh, people at agencies, it's usually one of those. Well, you know, I don't have that much money, or this thing. Uh, insert my polymer gun works just fine. Why do I need something fancy? And so, um, you know, I'm not I'm not one. I'm not a salesman. I think as cops, we all are, uh, lo- you know, walking lie detectors. And so, when somebody comes in to sell us this this widget or this snake oil, the first thing we think of is like, ah, come on, man, here it goes again, right? So. Um, I, I think that it's very important to me to make sure that we, as, as other officers, um, give information, right? You're ultimately going to make the decision that you want to make. Um, I can't sway you one way or another. I can make sure that you are fully, uh, uh, information squeezed out of me so that you can make a good decision, but I have one here. Do you mind if I show it? Sure. Take a look. Okay, cool. So, um, unloaded safe, right? Nothing in there just to make sure that nobody's going to yell at us or anything like that. So this is the um, the Staccato CS here. This is the newest iteration of uh, the 2011 platform. It's a three and a half inch bull barrel aluminum frame um, optic ready gun with uh, polymer frame. Um, this is essentially everything that we wanted out of a duty gun, but just smaller. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, There's proprietary uh, spring and recoil uh, stuff on the inside that we can can't really go over in particular. But what I can tell you is this. Is if you're looking for a high capacity 1911 style gun or 2011, uh, take a look at at the staccato. We have the external extractor here. You can get, you know, for me, uh, it's all about black on black on black. So you can get the DLC uh, barrel here. The trigger shoe is aluminum. It comes in a flat or a curved bow here. Uh, what we have done differently than um, than before on this, since this is the three and a half inch uh, version, so we have a three point nine inch C two, um, and then we have a four point four five P, which is usually for like uh, it's equivalent to a Glock seventeen, is what I kind of tell people. And then we have the overall five inch of the XT, which is compensated gun. And then we have, you know, like our five and a half inch uh, race gun, the XL. So um, usually people are around the, the P level. Some people, depending on what, um, I guess, capacity want, they want to carry, they're in the C2 range, uh, the four inch style. Uh, but this is the smallest of all of them. It shoots the same as the large gun. So um, the first thing I'll tell people is, hey, listen, before you start saying anything good, bad, or indifferent, I'm not here to sell you a gun. Find somebody that has these. Um, there's a difference between hype and truth, right? The hype is when these first first came out, when we switched from STI to staccato, it was more, hey, can we make a duty firearm? I think that we've proven that over the years of being uh, around that we make uh, the 2011 and everybody else is compared to, to staccatos at this point for a 2011 platform. So, um, It's really one of those get out and shoot it kind of guns. I could tell you all day long until I'm blown in the face how great it is. Um, 16 plus one capacity for this. The P will come 
uh, with uh, 17 round mags or 20 round mags. If you're law enforcement, active uh, law enforcement or retired military, we have a hero program, um, which is kind of like the, the blue line program. Uh, so you get a discount through factory, you get six mags and priority shipping. So um, if you're active uh, law enforcement, then you'll get your gun before most other people. And so to me, it's one of those things of, you know, we're, we're all tradesmen, right? Um, if, if a carpenter comes into your house to fix your stairs and they come in there with the cheapest tools, what are you going to think of them, right? And so uh, why are you going to come in with the least expensive tool on your belt for the worst case scenario? Don't you want the best? Um, and and so not not to like pressure people into that because these guns are not, they're not cheap, but they're well made. It's 100% made in America from the steel that comes in to make these to the aluminum that comes in to make these. And they're made by veterans. They're made by uh, former LE and they're just fantastic, fantastic people. So um, the customer service that you get after you purchase the gun is just hands down second to none. Um, and not only that, but there's plenty of people out there that'll be able to let you put, put your hands on their gun and try it out. And I suppose we can go over some of the other details of all the blue, blue team stuff uh, in a little bit, but yeah, and I understand it's staccato is not new. It, you've got over a thousand agencies using the staccato firearms, and and then you do the accompanying uh, training, the blue team training. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so blue team in itself is essentially um, we have our our sales reps for West Coast and uh, for Central United States and East Coast, and that's where kind of everything funnels through. So when when we have agencies that want to make agency purchases. We go through all of our, uh, our sales reps and uh, JR and Rick are just fantastic people. Um, but blue team itself is just guys like me that know the firearms that know about them, that have been carrying them that are, you know, uh, hopefully right. Reputable people in the uh, industry that are able to assist agencies where the salespeople might not be able to get out to. Right. And so if you are an agency and you need something, um, and you're kind of in the middle of nowhere, instead of the sales rep coming all the way out to you, you might have a blue team member um, somewhere in the area that uh, can assist you with getting the information that you need, right? Um, another another great thing about the blue team is that, you know, every agency is specific and being not all agencies offer uh, officers to carry their own type of pistol. Sometimes it's, hey, here's what you get. Don't throw a fit, right? Um, but for those agencies that are open and available to changing their policy, updating their policy, making it more relevant to those people that want the better tools, the blue team uh, people are the ones that can reach out to you, help you out with a change of policy, help you out with those transition courses, because we understand going from uh, striker fire pistols to single action only or anything is going to require some training. We have all those documents from, like you said, over a thousand agencies that approve these um, for use, and we can help get not only the approval letters, um, but the, like the policy through, you know, like we use Lexapol. So a lot of our Lexapol policy stuff can, can be copied and pasted. Lexapol is very good about making generic policies. And then you um, as an agency can kind of define what you wanted to fit within your, your, uh, your realm there. So um, we can help you out with those kinds of things a little bit differently than a sales rep, right? Because unfortunately, unfortunately, at the same time, well, our, our sales reps are formerly, so they'll be able to help you. But the blue team guys will be the boots on the ground kind of people that are just going to interact with you and help you out through the process. And eventually, if you needed like a test and evaluation gun for your agency to make sure that they're uh, appropriate and approved, then you can go through the uh, Rick or JR to get those things done. It's a very easy process. Um, there's just a ton of information that, that we can go over that, Hey, if you're an officer that's involved in a shooting, include, uh, involving a staccato and your staccato gets taken away, um, that you need, you can let us know at staccato and we'll send you a replacement gun or we'll send your department a replacement gun to cover that until you get your gun back. So, um, it's just one of those things that the company itself just looks out for LE first responders and, uh, military as well, just to make sure that, you know, what's done is the right thing. And sometimes the right thing costs money and it's, it is what it is. And we'd rather spend the money and do it the right way than, you know, kind of shortcut everything and, and get something done. Unfortunately, the the more difficult way or the cheap way, because uh, cheap implies poor quality. So we don't want that. Right. No, I'm, I'm with you. I had, you know, several years back when we were, we could purchase our own handgun to carry. We went from a 
tell you how old I am. We went from a six shooter to a semi. And of course I, I bought one of the newer polymer guns until, I don't know, a couple thousand rounds later, uh, I had to take it into our, our armory because I couldn't get the slide back. And mm. after the armor put it in a vice and hit it with a wooden hammer a couple of times, he finally got the slide back and that gun was sold, you know, two days later. So I am all about right. metal, metal pistols. Yeah. Hey, hey, shifting gears a little bit. We're always looking for an advantage. We're going to wrap up here. And I want to hear your final thoughts on what you would say to a department looking to assess or restructure their SWAT team. What would be the three priorities that you would stress to some somebody stepping in to do an assessment of their team? I, I think the, speaking with the leadership of the team that's already currently there is huge. Uh, getting the information of the team's capabilities at, as is, is uh, probably one of the biggest things and, and making sure that uh, the team is either feels that they're ready to be deployed or, or is not for whatever reason. Um, restructuring is a tough one. And, and I, I even see that as cyclical because sometimes you'll lose um, due to attrition, a bunch of team team members. And so you have to replace, uh, like on our team, we had to replace quite a few uh, individuals over the last couple of years because of attrition. And so picking the right people is is very important um, because, you know, you can't you can't unpick people, right? As soon as people are chosen for teams, um, it's, it's our job to make sure that we train them as best as we can. Once you've picked the right people and figured out uh, if you guys are deployable, I think the training and the ongoing training, the needs of your community and what your uh, your SWAT team's capabilities are going to be, whether it be, hey, we have a bunch of uh, soft targets that we need to assess and we need to plan for, or maybe it's back to uh, training, right? If we have a bunch of new people or we don't have a team, like you were saying, um, most SWAT teams when uh, they first began out here on the West Coast are like, Hey, here's this M16A1, and uh, you know it's full auto. This is back in the '90s, right? Full auto and some some camouflage uniforms, and you know we can give you this plate carrier, but it's just it is what it is, right? Uh, into now, where you have all these teams that are you know in insert very nice uniforms here with very nice plate carriers. So there's still teams out there that are that are doing the Lord's work in all their own purchased equipment, and and God bless them for that. But <laughs> Um, it, it's, it's huge to make sure that the training is appropriate for what they need as a community. Once they get the training, um, then equipment, right? After the equipment, um, now, depending on uh, the, uh, the tenure of the officers, I know that sometimes when you're new, you want to carry all of the things. And so, um, you know, there's pros and cons about that. I've never heard somebody come out of a gunfight saying, man, that was way too many bullets for that gunfight. <laughs> um, but at the same time, as you get older, you know, your bones start getting a little older as well. And so you want to make sure that uh, you're carrying uh, what's appropriate on your kit. And, and uh, so equipment wise, uh, firearms, you know, you have your, your, your primary weapon and then your backup weapon. And so uh, making sure that they're very capable with both of those in all situations, because uh the end result is safe, right? And we need everybody to go home. We need the situation to be resolved. And the only way to do that is uh, thoroughly vetted people with thoroughly vetted training and thoroughly vetted equipment. You can't just go out there and get the newest thing because it's the newest widget. You know, you have to vet all your people, vet all your training trainers, because there's, gosh, again, we can go into a whole nother podcast on types of training and people that do training, but uh, there's a ton of, of great trainers out there with a ton of real world experience um, that'll be able to help out from medical training to open field tactics to vehicle assault tactics to active shooter stuff. So um, get, getting the right people, making sure that uh, your training is uh, up to par for what you need for your city or community, and then all the correct equipment, including a staccato, because I don't know if you can be a SWAT team anymore without a staccato. So. Okay. I see what you just did there. Hey, that in. <laughs> hey, Nick Roberts, thanks so much for taking time today. Marine police officer, SWAT operator, and leader. Uh, love to see what you're doing and, and what you're talking about. You know, we are through attrition losing some really good leaders in the, the whole uh, special operations groups. Uh, Sid Heal, a mentor of mine, we just lost last year written some great books on SWAT and weapons. Um, great to see people like you uh, uh, moving up the ranks as well. Thank you, sir. Pleasure to be here. And thanks for having me. 
All right. Hey, and to our listeners, check out the show notes. You'll see the rest of uh, Nick's bio and the Staccato 2011 information. The website's linked there. And uh, hey, stay safe out there. And um, hope to talk to you again real soon. Drop me a line at policing matters at police1.com if you've got any comments or uh, other information that we should be talking about here on the show. That's policing matters at police1.com. All right, take good care. Talk to you again real soon.